We're, we're ready for the first keynote uh, talk of the conference. And uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, who is Christoph Koch. And Christoph and I were just reminiscing. Uh, we met at the very first conference in 1994, the very first uh, Science of Consciousness, or Tour to Science of Consciousness, it was known as back then, which was held at the hospital on, on campus. And uh, we've known each other and have been friends ever since. And uh, he is now the, uh, he was at Caltech then, he is now the chief scientist of the uh, MindScope program at the Allen Institute in Seattle, and the chief scientist for the Tiny Blue Dot Foundation. I think it's fair to say that Christoph is one of the, if not the most well-known, foremost neuroscientists in the world. And he's going to speak to us on consciousness and the brain. Please give a warm welcome to Christoph Koch. Other slides live? Yeah. So first of all, I wanted to start off by thanking the person who introduced me, Stu Hameroff, who's really been um, the, uh, the heart, the beating heart of this, um, of this conference and of the, uh, the new field of the science of consciousness for the past 30 years, starting with uh, the first conference that made it into a nice MIT Press book towards the science of consciousness that was in 90. Uh, 94, so 28 years ago, time flies. Uh, then with a meeting in 2012 where Francis Crick, with whom I worked at the time, and, and I, we both attended. And then uh, this uh, really very nice um, take on the Beatles, uh, the, the, the 2014 20th anniversary meeting. And so, um, yeah, without, without used to, we, none of us would be here, and the field would be a whole lot poorer for it. So, thank you very much. And yes, we're good friends, although we, we have different views on the biophysics of the brain. But I'll come to that. There he is, always smiling. All right, so um, I'll talk a little bit about the progress, um, or uh, yeah, the progress since, uh, since those um, Halcon days in 94. So I'll talk about four, uh, four, really five themes, isolating the physical substrate of consciousness, what I'll be primarily concerned about uh, today and to dissociate those from the myriad of processes that precede consciousness, that are coextensive with consciousness, and that follow consciousness. I'll talk about some really exciting development, uh, biomarkers for consciousness. I mean, it's easy to talk about the mind-body problem, the pontificate about idealism and materialism and panpsychism and the unity of everything in the cosmos but then to actually make real measurable progress towards something that can help people and help patients, I think is really a big, a big deal to show that we can make progress in, these, uh, in this question that at least in the West has, has been articulated since, at least since the time of Aristotle in his book on uh, De Anima. I'll talk about the rise of theories of consciousness. I think that's, made, that's a new phenomenon that's really happened only over the last 25 years that that's uh, something very new in the mind-body problem. I'll talk a little bit about psychedelics and their promise to understand, help us understand consciousness. And then at the end, I'll talk about a, a new funding opportunity that as an officer of the Tiny Blue Dot, uh, uh, I'd like to talk about a little bit to announce it. All right, so uh, what I mean by consciousness, I make it very clear. This, so this is one particular conscious experience. Um, it's, um, it's one out of an infinite number of experiences that we can have. It's a pe peculiar one because it w involves a complete lack of self-consciousness. It involves a complete lack of, of um, consciousness of body, of the external environment, of passage of time. Space is almost shrunk to, um, to um, a single point. Um, but it's a, it's a, nonetheless, it's a conscious experience. It's a near-death experience that I had uh, early on, uh, just in the beginning of the, of the pandemic. Then this is sort of a more different everyday experience of the sort that we encounter day in, day out. It's what uh, William James, 
the, the father of American psychology, called the stream of consciousness. So this involves all sorts of things. It involves sensory experiences, you know, vision, your, your, including your body. Uh, it includes memories. It includes uh, thoughts. It includes knowledge of self-consciousness, which is one particular aspect of, uh, of consciousness. Both, share, both these conscious experiences, both sort of the near-death experience as well as the everyday, conscious, uh, the everyday experiences, share a certain number of features. They're, in particular, they're private. You know, they're unique to me. Uh, they have certain uh, features. They are intrinsic, they are specific, they are, they are holistic, and they are definite. Uh, and they're all, if you really think about it, quite ineffable. And if you never had a conscious experience, of course, it's very difficult to describe what a conscious experience is like. So the definition that sort of um, I've adopted following the uh, philosopher Thomas Nagel is uh, an organism like you and I and mice and, and cats and dogs and maybe lots of other things on this planet um, has conscious mental states if and only if it's like to be that organism. So it, it feels like something for that organism to be. It feels to be in love or angry or sad or in pain or any of these myriad states of, of consciousness. Now, there's a widespread sleight of hand in, many, uh, in some theories of consciousness and in many people when they talk about consciousness. Uh, and I think this is, uh, uh, this is partly due to the, uh, the remaining strong influence of uh, Anglo-American uh, uh, logical positivism, and in particular also in Silicon Valley. Where thinking about consciousness, what happens very quickly, but often it's just sort of, you know, out of view, there's this confusion between what consciousness is and what consciousness does. And those are really two very different things, and it's very important to keep them apart. Ultimately, what consciousness is, is a state of being. You know, I'm, you know, I'm in a particular state and have a particular um, experience. And that relates to, but it's quite different from, wh what this consciousness can do. You know, once I'm conscious, I can plan, I can uh, reminiscence, I can use that information that I'm conscious of to do all sorts of other things. But one shouldn't substitute the phenomenology that's really the living, beating heart of consciousness. If you don't explain the phenomenology, you haven't really explained the problem of consciousness. You've only explained the, 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 what you can do with consciousness, but not what consciousness is with, uh, with function. And so um, uh, I believe in, uh, that consciousness can be dissociated from behavior. Right? We do this every night when we go to bed and we, we fall asleep and then we wake up inside our body without having any me uh, measurable behavior and we have conscious states or doing you know, um, all sorts of other uh, states when people are in, unable to move yet are conscious. It can be dissociated with, with, from intelligence, from planning, from reasoning, social cognition, top-down attention. Uh, and from uh, working memory. Those are all processes that are sometimes often commingled, like in early on the session there was a talk about the relationship between attention and consciousness. They can clearly relate. So you, there are cases when you attend to something and become conscious of it. But there are also other cases where you can attend to things that you're not conscious of. And furthermore, you can show that you can be conscious of things without necessarily attending to them. And, and so it's really important, and this is what of course makes the life of um, uh, grad students and, and uh, psychologists and cognitive uh, neuroscientists trying to dissociate these, these things to really focus on the, the beating heart, the living heart of the problem, of the mind-body problem. All right, so I worked, as uh, you know, as many of you know, I worked for many years uh, with, uh, with Francis Crick uh, at the time at the Salk Institute after he finished his molecular biology phase of his life and moved from, from Cambridge, England to La Jolla uh, to the Salk Institute. He became very interested in this problem and, and I, as a young Turk, was also interested and we are both sort of surprised that most of the major textbook of neuroscience didn't have an entry of con uh, consciousness at the time. Even most textbook of anesthesiology <laughs> didn't have an index entry of consciousness, which is sort of surprising because the job, uh, as, as Stuart does, of course, professionally, this, the job of uh, anesthesiologists is to render you unconscious. So th th that sh one might have expected a deeper confrontation with the problem of what consciousness actually is. But there wasn't, which is sort of a holdover of, of, from the area of behaviorism and I believe the pernicious influence uh, 
uh, of, um, of logical positivism, going all the way back to, uh, to, the, to Vienna. Um, so then we, uh, we argued, well, let's avoid all the, these, um, these interesting, heuristic, um, very scholarly, learned debate about uh, philosophy and what sort of ism, what particular ism one should have in order to attack uh, consciousness, because over the, they haven't really led to all that much problem, and just focus on something that we can do today. After all, today we're in the area, era where we have brain imaging, functional imaging, um, we have single neuron recordings, in, rarely in people, more commonly in animals. We have all sorts of fantastic molecular tools now to really discern this precise identity of cells. So let's focus on that. And so let's search for the minimal neuronal mechanisms that are jointly sufficient for any one conscious experience. So this is what today people call the NCC, the Neural College of Consciousness. And there's going to be NCC for every, for every possible conscious experience. And even if you just have a vague feeling that something is amiss, there will be a correlate for that, just as much as there will be for the color red, for seeing the color red, or for having a, a, a toothache. Those two experiences I, I listed before, I gave you, they will have a specific neural correlate. And we can ask what is common among all of them. Do they all occur in one part of the brain? Do they involve one particular physical or biophysical mechanism, one particular cell type, one particular signature, um, et cetera, et cetera? And this is not just a correlate. I mean, at early on, it's just a pure correlation. You, you put person, people in a, on animals in a conscious state, and then you use various imaging or interventionist tools to study what, what is the, the, and I'll give you a couple of uh, examples. But ultimately, of course, you want to have something more powerful. You want to go, move from correlation to causation. And so you want to be able to induce the NCC. If you really have the NCC, let's say, for, for the color, red or for uh, you know, a particular uh, sort of pain, then if you induce the uh, uh, NCC artificially by some technological means, then you should have the experience. Conversely, if you inactivate the NCC, again, by some electrode or TMS device or drug or whatever, then you will eliminate the experience. And, and then David Chalmer subsequently really wrote very nicely and very crisply about uh, how precisely to define the, the NCC. I'll come back to him later on. So this is a typical, it's a cartoon representation typically uh, of a typical experiment like done in fMI. But the, as I said, this can be done using EEG or PET or single neurons or molecular, you know, using um, uh, CFOS, uh, molecular expression, whatever. And so here, for example, you flash very briefly. The trick is always to compare. So this is for the content-specific neural correlate of consciousness. So let's see. I want to know what's the mechanism that underlies my conscious perception of a face. A face, OK? So one way to do it, you flash very briefly. There are myriads of ways. But one way you flash very briefly, uh, let's say, for 15 milliseconds, an image, like this image here, that's sort of chaoscuro, sort of somewhat foggy, noisy. And so you can arrange this. You can uh, arrange the amount of noise so that half the time you see it and half the time you don't see a face. Now, it's not that you see nothing. But in one case, you just see you know, some sort of a foggy pattern. In the other case, you clearly see a, um, a face. And so now you can do this within subject comparison. You, you sort all the times when you saw, clearly saw the face and compare, the, in this case, the fMI, the bold activity, with all the time when you didn't see a face. And then you can do a contrastive approach. Right? Very standard in cognitive neuroscience today. And in this case, you'll see at the bottom there, you'll see all sorts of places pop up. In this case, a, a ring of regions outside my primary visual cortex called exocyte. Um, an area here um, um, on the underside of cortex in the fusiform gyrus called the, the face area. And then some parts of the prefrontal cortex light up. So you can say, well, so those, that's a neural correlate of consciousness of seeing a face versus not seeing a face. Now, of course, you have to constantly worry, well, what else is going on? So for instance, here you're pressing a button. So maybe this pattern has to do that in one case you press the right button versus the left button. Or you're doing actually a task. Here you're being asked to judge, which seems trivial, but it's going to occupy some brain real estate. It's going to take some processing for you to accomplish this task, to remember that you, if you see a face, you're supposed to press this. And if you don't see a face, you're supposed to press that button. And so if you control, for instance, of that, what you can see in this case, it's called a no report paradigm. 
Some of that area, for, uh, the, particularly the activity in the front of the brain falls away because that turns out is related to the execution of the task and or possible for the, the memory of the task. And you get, in this case, just pieces of brain in the back, the exostride cortex and the fusiform gyrus. Now, of course, you also have to worry, well, what about attention? In both cases, there's attention, so you have to control for that. You have to control for eye movements. So there are myriads of things that you have to control for, and, and this is a, a still ongoing search. And um, it's non-trivial because consciousness is so closely int int intertwined with lots of other cognitive operations. So ultimately, what you want, you want uh, an NCC, as I mentioned, your correlate of consciousness. So here I'm looking out. This is done by an artist, sort of mirrors Ernst Mach, famous uh, drawing. I'm looking out of my left eye at my Bernese mountain dog, Ruby. She's sitting there and looking at me. And that's a particular conscious experience. And you need to map that, every aspect of that, every single phenomenal distinction of that, the way, the way she looks, the way I, she smells, and which is part of my experience, all of that, the emotional response I may have to, um, to my dog, all of that ultimately has to map on specific facets of the underlying neural activity with nothing left over. It's a complete, you know, ultimately it has to be complete. Every aspect of conscious, conscious phenomenal experience has to have a physical substrate in the brain. They're not identical, of course. In fact, they're very, very different, right? It doesn't, there's no picture inside my brain I can show you. It's pretty dark inside my skull. So, but, so they're certainly not identical, but they have to map on, they have to have this lawful relationship to each other. Now, a different technique, uh, which is more often done in the clinical context, uh, is to compare the full, what's called the full NCC. The, so the, 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 the union of all possible neural correlates of consciousness for every possible experience, and the way to do that is to compare, let's say, when you're conscious versus when you're unconscious, in this case by sleep or by anesthesia. Um, so on, on the left, it's sort of a within-state paradigm where you take people, as, you know, you do quiet restfulness in the, magnum for, in the magnum, for instance, with eyes closed, versus when they are asleep, which is not easy. In the, in the confines of a scanner, but can be done, let's say stage three, uh, uh, non-REM sleep, and then you compare which part of the brain uh, are active. Or, as has been done by, um, in a really nice paper by Siklari, a within-state uh, no-task paradigm, where people are asleep, you do high-density uh, um, polysomnography, you wake people up at random moments, and you ask them what, if anything, went through their mind. And sometimes they tell you, even, let's say, in a non-REM state, Nothing went through my uh, mind, which is what expected. But then often, even in non-REM states, people have dreams. They're not as vivid as the sort of the, the, the story, the, the long narrative dreams that we typically remember early on uh, or late in night when we uh, wake up. Uh, but, but, but you can certainly have dreams within non-REM state, or you wake people up during a REM stage when they are according to PSG and REM, and sometimes they don't have, they don't remember anything during REM, or they have no experience. And very often, of course, they do. 70% of the time, they do have experience. And again, you can compare that. So that's a cleaner within state uh, um, uh, comparison. Because when you compare two different states, not only does consciousness change, let's say, between non-REM and REM, but of course, the entire brain is different. In one case, it's activated. There are noradrenergic and cholinergic cells active. In the other case, they're not. So you, you want to equilib you want to sort of do as much as possible apple to apples uh, in comparison. All right, now it's really important um, to distinguish arousal versus consciousness. Um, and, and this is often difficult to do, particularly in the context, let's say, of a, of a clinic when you have a patient, you know, who had just had a traumatic brain injury or, or cardiac arrest. It's very, it may be very difficult to distinguish them. But sort of conceptually, of course, we, we can do that. So arousal, you know, varies continuously in a very periodic man, uh, a manner with uh, the, the circadian rhythm. So it's, it's high now. Hopefully I haven't put anyone to sleep when it would be lower, of course. And once we go to bed, it, be it, it becomes low. Um, and so typically, most of our everyday experience, conscious experience, occur during a state of, of high arousal, like now, or when you're watching a movie or, or reading a book. Uh, 
But, and so you can see this nice, this is from the classical paper by Steve Loris. You know, on the, on the x-axis, you plot the level of arousal. In the, on the y-axis, you plot sort of um, uh, consciousness. Even in low level of arousal, they're, they're really, it's important they're not the same. So you can have a state of low arousal and you can still uh, be conscious. So for instance, and, and, and conversely, you can be in a high state of uh, arousal and not be conscious. So for example, during REM sleep, by definition, you're in low state of arousal because it's relatively difficult to awake you when you're in, in a REM sleep compared to being already awake. So you're in a, in a high state of arousal. Your brain is certainly very active. Your EEG is very active, right? Why it was, which is why it's also called paradoxical sleep. Um, um, yet uh, your, your brain is aroused behaviorally. Uh, uh, you have very low level of arousal, yet you're highly conscious. You have conscious ex experiences. Conversely, there are states on the lower right when you are, um, when you're, let's say, sleepwalking without any evidence of, um, of consciousness or during uh, certain complex partial seizures, again, without any evidence of consciousness, where you have high arousal and, and low, uh, where you have high arousal and low level of consciousness. So those two things can be dissociated. In fact, when you have a patient and the only thing they can do, they open their eyes, you can have two different, uh, quite different patients. You can have a locked in patient who has, this low, who has some level of arousal, but very little, because the only thing they can control are their, their eyes, right? Yet they're fully conscious. Conversely, you have a patient in a vegetative state who can, by definition, this is one reason why it differs from coma, because they have these circadian uh, wake, uh, uh, wake sleep cycle. They do open their eyes, yet as far as we can tell, in the vast majority, in more than two-thirds of, of the majority of them, there is no consciousness. So in this case, same level of arousal, but high consciousness versus uh, no consciousness. So they can be um, experimentally um, and dissociated. And we know a lot, and I think Yuri Zalman, the, the, the last author of that bottom study on the right, will talk about it more tomorrow. We, we're now getting really very good, at least in experimental animals, in rodents, and particularly in this case in non-human primates. It was a, just a series of, of four papers from three different labs to really dissociate arousal where you can systematically manipulate it by stimulating certain parts of the central thalamus, um, the, 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 the central part the, towards the medial side of the thalamus, and, and thereby promote arousal in cortex, and then the animal can wake up even though it may be still under anesthesia. All right, so uh, what are some of the best candidates for, for the neural correlates of consciousness we have? Well, so first it's important to point out where it's not. And this should give us some pause because if we look at when, where it's not, it can tell us what, what's different about those places. So for example, the spinal cord. It's a tube, 18 inch long, roughly, running down our back. You know, it's like a garden hose, a little bit less than, you know, uh, three quarters of an inch. Has hundred millions of perfectly decent neurons that have synapses and learning rules and everything you want. Yet if you lose them, or let's say that you have an upper, an upper spinal cord, like, uh, like um, Christo Reeves here had, the Superman actor, you're uh, paralyzed, your life has changed radically, Yet your, your consciousness really hasn't changed. Your conscious experience really hasn't changed. Uh, so what is it about the spinal cord that, that's, what, what, why is it inadequate to produce consciousness? We don't know. An even more dramatic case is the cerebellum. So you probably know the majority. In four <laughs> aged Brazilian men, People have counted the number of neurons in, in, their, in their brain using a complete, using an interesting stereological procedure. It's 86 billion, so call it 100 billion neurons, right? 10 to the 11 neurons. 80% of those neurons are in the part of the brain, the cerebellum at the back. Now, some of the most complicated neurons, most beautiful neurons, are these Purkinje cells there you can see on the left. They're these beautiful coral shapes, you know, uh, like a fan structure. Very complex, dendritic spikes galore, calcium learning, really cool stuff, occupies thousands of, of neuroscientists, yet it doesn't seem to be associated with consciousness, and we know this directly from lesions. So I talked to uh, at least one 
I talked to a head of friend, an acquaintance really, from Stanford, an MD, PhD, and he had, um, after he graduated, on the day he was assigned his residency, he learned that he had a large uh, meningioma in his cerebellum. And the surgeon had to go in and remove three by four by five centimeter, a big chunk of cerebellar tissue. Uh, and then we, I had, we, had, we had a long interview afterwards to try to ascertain what was different about his conscious experience. And if he, to, as far as he could tell, nothing was different. There are certain things he couldn't do anymore, like playing violin, like doing texting and all of that. Obviously, you know, he had sort of some sort of ataxia, but his consciousness wasn't really impaired. And typically these patients with cere cerebellar lesion do not complain about lack, that they lack certain, uh, you know, conscious experiences. And so here we have a very rare case of a complete cerebellar agenesis. So this uh, woman, this Chinese woman, was born without a cerebellum. Where the cerebellum should be is just an empty hole filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And she was certainly conscious, no question about it. So what is it about the cerebellum that makes it inadequate for consciousness? Probably it has to do with the fact that its circuits all feed forward. And it's organized in two-dimensional independent slabs. It doesn't have this 3D um, nearest neighbor architecture of, of uh, cortex has. That plus the fact that it's, it's all feed forward. I think that uh, uh, primarily feed forward. There are no excitatory uh, loops unlike uh, cortex. I think is the primary reason why, although it may be a very sophisticated computer, um, it doesn't give rise to the experience of life. So all the evidence really points to this structure in us. That doesn't mean that other creatures that don't have a cortex cannot have consciousness. I'm not saying that. I'm saying in humans or in, in mammals, let's say, uh, I don't want to be a, uh, you know, I'm not a human exceptionalist. In mammals, it's neocortex that's most closely linked to consciousness. Furthermore, that does not mean necessarily that if you never had a cortex, let's say because you were due to a birth tube de defect in, uh, when, you, when you developed in your mom's uh, uh, belly, you had a, a you a, you lacked any ability. You didn't de uh, develop really a complete forebrain, right? So um, these uh, um, these children, they are uh, they you know they have usually a, a very sh a much smaller head. They don't have any uh, cortex, a cortic a cortical, and it's very unclear whether they're conscious at all. They may be conscious of a few, a few things like emotion. It's not quite clear. They have extremely reduced uh, behavioral capability. But what, what I'm speaking now about is everyday people that grow up, grow up with a relatively neurotypical um, brain. In those people, it's neocortex that really gives rise to, to conscious experience. Cortex is in all of, all of us mammals, whether we're humans or dogs or mice, it's a two-dimensional two structure. It's like a pizza in us. It's like 12 to 14 inch. It's the thickness of a pizza with toppings, two to three millimeter. And it's highly, you know, highly convolved. And you have two of them, one in the left and one in the right. In, the, in a monkey, it's like a big peanut butter cookie. And in mice, the animals that we study at the institute, it's sort of more, it fits comfortably in the sugar cube. The, ba the basic structure is remarkable similar across all species. Remarkable. So you can see here, this is in a macaque monkey, but in humans it's the same, it's a sort of highly layered. So it's a, I think of it as a two plus epsilon dimensional technology. In us, like two and a half millimeters uh, thick. And so this is what, what my institute excels at. We just published uh, six nature papers last, uh, last fall about it, where we, you can describe sort of like a periodic table, the, the, the various cell types that make up this brain. And it, in particular cortex. And the, 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 the news is, good news or bad news, depending on your point of view, they're not just excitatory cells and inhibitory cells. They're not just pyramidal cells and spiny stellate cells. They're roughly on the order of 1,000 to 2,000 different types of cells. They're highly heterogeneous. They differ by gene express, by, by uh, synaptic markers, by where they project to, by their dendritic architecture and morphology, et cetera. And um, the belief is now in the field that to understand any one particular disease, um, particular psychiatric disease, it's really critical to know which cell type is affected. And so one suspects that something like consciousness will also involve not just one whole cell class like pyramidal cells, but there are 20 or 30 different types of pyramidal cells. And it'll be in future important to identify which specific one, because they also have different receptors. like. The, the entire, you know, 27 family, a member family, serotonin 
5-HT uh, receptors. You know, they, they all are distributed in, in, in different proportion across these different cell types. So it's really a, a breathtaking um, in complexity. So what type of evidence do we have that it's cortex? Well, the best and strongest studies, uh, strongest evidence comes from lesion studies, uh, which is sort of nature experiments uh, for given structure and neuronal population being uh, necessary. Of course, you have, to, you have to think about plasticity and recovery. So anything in the brain is, you have to uh, interpret with a great deal of caution. Equally powerful are stimulation. So lesion studies are natural experiments where typically do a do gunshot or vascular, you know, stroke or heart attack, or sometimes because the surgeon has to go in and remove certain parts of the brain, we can see we can study the patient afterwards. Stimulation is again a, a sort of is less natural, but artificial experiment where you can go in, into the brain either of a neurosurgeon, uh, of a neurosurgical patient to stimulate. That's typically done during a workup, clinical workup, let's say for, for epileptic surgery, but also for other, for other uh, reasons. Uh, the surgeon has to go in there and to precisely map out, uh, for example, uh, if, if they want to remove uh, uh, part of the brain that has a tumor. And of course, you can do this now in animals using uh, powerful tools, optogenetics. They're powerful, but again, you have to be very careful interpreting them. And then uh, weaker, but much more, po uh, much more popular because they're so much easier to do, are recording and neuroimaging studies. So these are correlational studies where you put people in scanners or you study animals, mice, rats, um, um, uh, monkeys, you know, whatever your favorite animal system is, and, um, and correlate. All right, so there's huge evidence that I'm not going to present. You can look in, in most uh, at textbook of functional urology that you can have discrete lesions in, um, in the back of the brain, posterior cortex, so things uh, you know, uh, be behind the central uh, sulcus, particular parietal, temporal, and occipital uh, lobes, where you have specific loss of hearing, of, uh, of being able to do certain um, calculations, of being able to name things, of being able to see faces, of being able to see colors, to, ex uh, to experience colors, to experience sounds, um, to be uh, unable to do certain types of, mo of, of, um, of uh, to, to lack of access uh, to particular type um, uh, of sensitivity, to lose, you know, you, you're confused about whether, uh, what's left and what's right, et cetera, et cetera, and all of that is due to specific lesions in the, in the back of the brain. We know from experiments done in the early days of neurosurgery when we didn't have the precise imaging tools we have today and patients had to wait a whole lot longer until they had much, much uh, stronger symptoms uh, for, the, for the neurosurgeon to be, go, to be able to identify what, the, what was the problem. So I'll just briefly show two classical patients uh, cases, one by Donald Happen and Penfield himself, where uh, they had a patient where they had almost a complete bilateral prefrontal resection, in this case uh, due to epi ep uh, epileptic surgery. So as I said, because we're getting much better at local localizing this thing, you can intervene much sooner. Those experiments don't happen anymore, but they're part of the clinical records. And you can see there you can lose almost the entire front, including area 9, 10, 11, 12, 32, uh, 45, 47, and people go on and in this case live another 10 years or 12 years and seem to be fully conscious. Here another case by uh, so-called Brickner's a famous patient. There was a paper, an entire book written about him. Very de detailed case studies of the sort that are not done anymore where very large prefrontal cortex were, um, were resected, again here uh, in this case for a tumor. And um, the patient goes home, he was a stockbroker, he goes home is not being uh, is unable to to be a stockbroker, but he goes home, lives on his farm for for 17 years, clearly conscious. This is just a paper that just came out last week. I saw where people do large-scale studies at MGH. They look at uh, several hundred uh, patients following cardiac arrest. So when you get anoxic brain damage, and they uh, they try to see here, particularly in this image, they compare on the upper row. We look at people who recovered from cardiac arrest and, and look at the brain uh, matched to a population of people who did not recover, who are still alive, but who are disorders of consciousness, like, for instance, in a vegetative state case, and then try to compare the, in, in the differences in terms of the, the diffusion coefficient of the, of the image. Uh, 
Um, and what they concluded that by far the, the, um, and the best predictor of recovery or whether you stay in this DOC, in the, in the loss of consciousness case and, bec and become a, or remain a, a, pay, a vegetative state patient is damage in the back of the brain, in the occipital, in the occipital uh, 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 regions. Quite compelling. In fact, it's better, uh, you can better predict uh, the, the uh, um, disease burden than if you look at the entire brain. You're more accurate at just looking at the back of uh, or the posterior part of cortex. Yeah, and then, of course, we know from classical studies done by Penfield, this is a technique that was first done by a surgeon in, Penn, in Philadelphia in the 8080s, but since then it's become a mainstay of, of surgery where you stimulate the brain. So Penfield, of course, in his famous studies, reported these what he called experiential, exper experiential uh, episodes that you can trigger in, in by stimulating in this part, um, in this case, on the, le the left or the right side of the, of the um, uh, of the anterior uh, uh, temple pole, you can stimulate these discrete experiences of life that, that people had, uh, had had, the patient have had. It's not a hallucination because people know that they're in the, surg that they're in the, surgical, in the surgery, but, but you can uh, nonetheless stimulate the pre uh, previous lived experiences, while most part of particular, the vast part of the prefrontal cortex are called non-eloquent. So surgeons call them non-eloquent because if you remove them, there's no apparent uh, loss of function of the patient, N no apparent. Of course, there are subtle deficits that we own that, that you can study at the population level, but they're uh, subtle, um, um, with the exception, of course, if you remove the inferior uh, frontal gyrus lobe and you hit Broca's area, which is why this is called non-eloquent cortex. And we, we also know positive knowledge, for example, so if you stimulate the fusiform um, face area I mentioned before in the back of the brain, uh, above the, the tentorium, uh, but on the underside, you know, the fusiform gyrus that we know from imaging, from imaging they're bilateral, but if you stimulate them, only if you stimulate the right fusiform gyrus will you get conscious experiences of faces, or you get distortion in conscious experience of, um, um, of faces. It's really now beautiful, I mean, there are now really a whole set of beautiful stimulation study. This is a survey of 67 patients by Joseph Parvisi out of Stanford, this came out last year, where he stimulates, I guess you can call it hot or not, you, he looked at all these patients over the last 10 years, which part of the brain, so if you put an uh, electrode into cortex, very often you don't get anything. You stimulate, you know, at reasonable uh, currents, let's say two to 10 milliamp currents, which we know doesn't cause any chronic damage. And in, in, let's say in the back of the brain, you might get, you know, half the time you stimulate, the person gets some sort of visual experience or somatosensory cortex, the person may feel some sort of tingling. The, the more you go up the cortical hierarchy, the smaller the, the fraction of time the, the, the stimulus evokes anything. There are large areas, as I mentioned before, where if you stimulate off cortex, you don't seem to get uh, a conscious experience. And so in summary, we know from the clinic that large prefrontal lesions do not cause unconsciousness. We know that large posterior le uh, lesions, on the other hand, pred uh, predict coma, where you're totally unconscious, or vegetative state, where you have at least arousal. And we know that prefrontal cortex is mostly, not exclusively, but mostly silent from an experiential point of view, while stimulating posterior cortex uh, gives rise to specific conscious uh, content. Now, of course, we want to understand where's the difference. If this is really true, if it's the back of the brain but not the front, where's the difference? It must be in the connectivity. So what is it about the connectivity? The back of the brain is, topo is, is, is much more topographic organized. The front of the brain is sort of more random access uh, organized. Is that the difference that makes a difference? That's one hypothesis, but we don't know. Um, we do have some specific uh, content-specific uh, time markers of, uh, of neural correlate of consciousness. In this case, you know, you can show a stimulus, put a high density EG cap on subject, show a stimulus. Sometimes they see it, sometimes they don't. You subtract the evoked potentials, and then what you get there on the right, uh, called a VAN, a visual awareness negativity. You also get a, P3, a P3B, a late, um, a late positive potential called P3B, 
that uh, that doesn't really turns out it doesn't really it's not really a marker for um, or at least not a minimal marker for NCC. It may be a sufficient one because that that t tends to be associated once again with read out with actually doing a task. If you don't have to do a task and just look at something and you become fully conscious of it, the P3B doesn't seem to be present. And it seems to probably, it looks like a generalizer. So there's a visual awareness negativity, there's a somatosensory awareness negativity, there's an auditory uh, um, awareness negativity. Typically, they are over the contralateral side, as you would expect, right? So if something touches my, my right hand, I become aware of it over the left somatosensory cortex. The, the, either the primary or the secondary cortex that's associated with that particular modality. That makes, uh, makes sense. So as I mentioned before, we're now in the state where we know in cortex alone there are these, so this is just, this is from, uh, from our uh, data survey, uh, this is just in one particular visual area, in primary visual cortex, right? There are in this case probably 50 different morphoelectrical cell types. If you include transcriptomics, it's more like 100. And they all differ in the way they, uh, where their soma is, in which layer, uh, where they project the axon to, their electrophysiological response, etc. And so what we need to do now with the next 10, 20, 30 years is to track down, because it's not just one brain area that's involved in brain areas are unconscious. Really, the atoms of, of consciousness are underlying neural assemblies of large size or small size, we don't know. It's really their activity, not their whole brain activity. And so ultimately, we need to dissect these. These are the most complex networks that, we, that humanity has ever faced, vastly complex than anything in the non-evolved uh, non uh, world. So here, for example, these are recordings. In our case, we also work with human cells. These are human neurons in your middle temporal uh, gyrus. So these are neurons right now. You, we all have them in our head. The different colors denote the different compartments of these uh, neurons and the axons that are involved right now. And if you're going to remember anything of my talk tomorrow, it's because of activity in those, in those neurons. <laughs> now, as you heard uh, previously, the, with the previous speaker was online, Ma Matthew Larkham. So he has, for example, some specific ideas, some really elegant ideas about how the interplay between uh, input, um, feedback input into the layer one of these layer five pyramidal cells that meets bottom up input uh, into the layer four, uh, uh, that they meet, there's active currents involved, and this, this sort of handshake might be key to consciousness. That might uh, well be true, but we have to figure out, is that present in all new, in all pyramidal cells, just a subset uh, of that? So we are, we are trying to track down, you know, the NCC really down to the lowest level we can get. Or more relevant, the lowest level that's relevant for the phenomena we're trying to explain, consciousness. And so this raises a question that's been a key part of this meeting or the series of meetings that Stuart, of course, is very interested in, is the brain a quantum computer? So I just organized a workshop with Hartmut Neven, who's going to be a keynote speaker here on Friday and, in the, and the head of the, the Google Quantum quantum uh, computing lab in Santa Barbara together with, uh, with Stu. So I used two of those slides from that meeting. So I'm, very, I, I'm a physicist, my background, and I'm extremely interested in the question to what extent are large-scale quantum mechanical phenomena such as entanglement um, and coherence involved in things like the brain in general? You know, in general, for brain, is that something, a feature that evolution has selected for? Then you can also ask the question in particular with respect to consciousness. So the brain operates at room temperatures in an aqueous environment strongly coupled to the body and to the rest of the environment. So there's no question, so at this meeting we reviewed some of the really good evidence, uh, like say spin, uh, you know, for, for, for spins, um, um, that certain intramolecular processes so taking place within one or maybe two, within two uh, molecules, such as photosynthesis, depend on tunneling and coherence. It was a set of nature papers over the last 10 years, uh, studies. So the, the, such quantum effects may also be, uh, uh, such intramolecular quantum effects may also be of relevance for magnetoreception in cytochrome. I think that's the most compelling case, um, besides photosynthesis, in binding of volatile compounds for olfactory receptors, or possibly, although right now the evidence isn't there, for transitioning through uh, ionic channels. 
But the more relevant question we have to ask, because those are all um, uh, events that take place within molecules, intramolecular phenomena. But the scale that neuroscience is looking at is a much, is a larger one. Namely, so there the question is, what about are there in, uh, intermolecular events, so where you get quantum superposition for two neighboring ionic channels in a bilipid membrane, or 10 or 100 or whatever, over particular spatial domains? Or what about within it, entire neurons, and Ramanian neurons can be, you know, and are, they can be very big, right? I mean, certainly by, by microscopic, extend over many centimeters, or interneuronal scales. Um, now, so if we look at within cells, this is what I used to study um, uh, for 20 years at Caltech, and across membranes, the, the, the distribution, the ionic distribution of the relevant uh, you know, charge carriers, they're really described by electrodiffusion, the Nernst Planck equation, in watery solution, because that's what our brain is, it's most of what our body is, at 300 degrees Kelvin. So I'd like to point out that that's roughly 30,000 times hotter than, let's say, Google Sycamore quantum computer, right? So today's, if you look at IBM and, and Google and the other people who, who build uh, working quantum computers, they typically operate at 10 millikelvin. Okay, that's 10 millikelvin above absolute zero, while our bodies are roughly at 300 degrees and are tightly regulated. In fact, if you change your temperature by one or two degrees, you'll become either incoherent because you'll have high fever or you go into coma uh, if, if we cool your brain. So it's tightly regulated in the brain for, for a reason. And so, you know, that's a lot of 30,000 times hotter. That's, uh, that's a big challenge. So if you look at, for example, a single potassium ion, you know, it diffuses in one millisecond, which is sort of a relevant lower scale for, for neuroscience, certainly for any cognitive effect. In that one millisecond, it diffuses three and a half micrometers, while the de Bruegel wavelengths that would be relevant for, let's say, coherence um, and or for superposition uh, um, is 0.05 nanometers. Right? That's, uh, that's, uh, that's, again, almost six orders of magnitude difference between the diffusion lengths and the de Bruegel wavelengths. Um, if you look at a single ionic channel, right, and there are tens of, tens of thousands in any excitable uh, um, uh, neuron, uh, there are roughly 10,000 uh, uh, ions, typically cations, that cross in one millisecond. You know, it's a picocurrent. And macroscopic membrane currents, I mean, macroscopic at the level where we can measure them using electrodes, you know, arises out of the superposition of 1,000, 10,000 uh, of these microscopic, stochastic, all or non ionic channels and generate action potential, you know, the one millis half a millisecond, millisecond action potential, that's a primary currency of neuronal communication. The way neurons compute, well, certainly the way they communicate with each other uh, in cortex, for instance, is using action potential, because that's a f relatively, at the time scale of the brain, I, at the time scale of millisecond, that it's a fast, it's a fast way to transmit um, uh, information. So this involves a flow of, you know, hundreds, uh, you know, 10 to the eight, let's say, ions. Um, so in, in, in that one millisecond, they can travel, you know, depending on the diameter and whether it's myelinated, uh, the diameter of the axon, whether it's myelinated or not, they can tra travel, you know, one to 10 millimeters. And in a myelinated axon, like the, the, the spinal cord, you know, 10 centimeters maybe, all in a millisecond. Uh, so fast excitatory potential, the ones that neurons depend on to fire, uh, or, or not to fire, they have rise time again of a um, uh, rise time of a half a millisecond in a millisecond. Decay, of course, is, is dictated by passive membrane time constant, which is much slower. So all of this gives rise to the extracellular potential that we know how to describe. In fact, we've done a model here with uh, Anton Akipov to model this using uh, Maxwell's equation, classical physics, under the, electro um, the um, electroquasi-static approximation, where you can do first order neglect magnetic fields, and you can perfectly well uh, model them and model them quantitatively using classical physics. So all of this makes it just simply extremely unlikely. Of course, you, can, you, you know, never say never unless you have an existence proof of it. Um, but it just makes it extremely unlikely uh, for quantum phenomena to be relevant for cognitive neuro for cognition. Um, not for photosynthesis or for other things. So 
I think this evidence may, makes it really very difficult to have quantum mechanical effects. There may be, there may be quantum mechanical effect in very local pockets that are under a micron, like in a spine, but if you want them to coordinate within a neuron, which you need in order to give rise to the action potential, or if you want to, you know, uh, coordinate large ensemble of neurons, as we know from all the evidence consciousness involves, you know, may involve a million neurons, you have to coordinate them. I see no way you can do that uh, uh, while, pre uh, while preserving entanglement or coherence. All right, then I wanted to give you a, a sort of update on biomarkers. So detecting consciousness, I'm really excited, psyched about that because, as I said, it's one thing to, uh, to write about a mind-body problem, but it's another thing to actually make progress and build a, a conscious meter. You know, David Chalmers here was making fun of that 20 years ago with his uh, hair dryer. To actually build a conscious meter that would not, in all, in all, all possible cases, but at least in today's patient, tell us whether this patient right now is in front of uh, me. Maybe he's anesthetized, maybe not. Maybe he's in a, in a persistent vegetative state, falling, uh, you know, uh, cardiac arrest or something or not. I don't know. There are tens of thousands of these patients um, uh, to determine are they conscious or not. Why? Because AIDS have very heavy burden on loved ones, on caregivers, and on society. And very often, withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy typically happens, for example, for cardiac arrest, you, the doctors today put you, let's say, into, um, uh, uh, into thermo, they cool down your brain to protect you, then you, you wake up slowly afterwards, and then you are, let's say, in the state where the EG is incredibly irregular, it's there, or maybe partially burst suppression, or it may be there, and now the question is, what do you do with this patient? Is there, any, is there A, any evidence of consciousness, and B, what are the chances that they ever might recover? So it's both to diagnose as well as to prognosticate um, a possible emergence of consciousness. Under these conditions, 30 to 45 percent of these patients um, in agreement with, with loved ones uh, opt for uh, withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy. In the, abs in, the sort of, in the presence of this great diagnostic and prognostic uncertainty. So there are a whole bunch of biomarkers that are use, using this spontaneous EG. I won't get into it, it gets technical. A big, big problem is there's a huge diversity of spontaneous EEG. The regular EEG that you can read, you know, that Hans Berger discovered almost 100 years ago, you know, has these discrete transition, alpha, beta, and deep sleep and all of that. But if you look at a patient that may have a great variety of different pathologies, you know, due to viral infection or trauma or vascular incident or anoxica, they get very, very diverse EG, and it's very difficult to say from the spontaneous EG with any degree of certainty whether they're conscious or not. So different technique that bypasses that, that, uh, that bypasses sensory pathway that may be damaged is to directly knock the brain. That's essentially what you're doing. So this is a technique that was devised by Giulio Tononi and then was sort of developed over the last uh, 15 years by Marcello Massimini, essentially it knocks the brain and then you listen to the echo. So what you do with the TMS, trans, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, you stimulate the, overlying, the underlying cortex, you have a high density 64 channel electrode and you're looking at the reverberation and from that you complete a measure of sort of complexity called perturbational complexity index. So here you can do it in normals like me or assuming I'm a normal, you can do it here you, you can knock my brain and then you get, you know, this butterfly plot where you can see the, the EG, uh, um, you know, the electrical wave in response to this, um, to this, um, this uh, stimulus. And you can sort of compress that. Uh, that is, you can ask how much is it compressible? That essentially what, what you're doing with this PCI. If it's compressible a lot, let's say because the brain is equipotential in the worst case because, you know, flat line is effectively, or because it's very simple, the response is just a, a simple by stability. Neurons are in such a state that they can only hyperpolarize and then revert back, so they have no causal power on others. Um, then you get a low PCI. Uh, when it's in a more, more organized, more complex case, you get a high PCI. This is in, in deep sleep. There is a, a technique actually being done on, on a patient. And so you can do this in, in many cases. This has been published over the last years, where you know from various reasons that the, pay, that the subject is conscious, either because they're wakeful, or they tell you afterwards, I was asleep, but if you wake them up, I just had a dream. 
visual dream, or because, let's say, they were under ketamine, and this was also talked about this morning, ketamine, while it can be used or still is used for certain types of pediatric surgery, you're really not unconscious, you're dissociated, which is very different. Uh, so the, the, the PCI is high, the complexity of the brain is, is high. Anyhow, so it turns out at the level of individual patients, this is really important, it's not at the group level where it's really not useful. For, for this to be a clinical device at the level of individual patient, there's a threshold, happens to be 0.31. Whenever the brain complexity of the, of the EG is below that threshold, the patient is, seems to be, as far as we can tell, unconscious. When it's, uh, the brain complexity is above that level, the, brain, the patient is, is, um, is conscious. So there's a lot of active work in, in, in this area because, as, as I said, there's an unmet clinical need. The other, uh, let me, without, I'm not going to uh, explain any of these theories of consciousness. So what's happened over the last 30 years, that there's been a change, uh, this wasn't the case before, to real theories of consciousness. So what, I'm, what, I, do know, what I mean by theory is a sort of sophisticated theory that proceeds from a minimal set of non-conflicting assumptions and postulates, and no ad hoc assumption. You can't have a theory where you have a 50 ad hoc assumption that you just have to assume you don't know why. You want to keep that really to a minimum. Um, so you want to have a minimum set, sort of almost an axiomatic approach of non-conflicting assumptions and postulates that are, uh, that are amenable to empirical falsification and, and, and verification. Uh, this and the, the key project here, they need to explain how conscious states relate to the, to the underlying substrate, the NCC. But they also need to, and this is a test met by far fewer, it's not, it's not just a mystery how consciousness arises out of, uh, out of matter, highly active matter, but also why does it feel so different? So why time flows, right? We all of the experience, the passage of time. It's a very different conscious experience than space. Space is extended. You know, whether you're in front of a black canvas or in front of the, the sky here in, in Tucson last night, or this, it's always extended or auditory space, or some other sensory taste. And so how does that arise? Or the, the, the qualia associated with color, or with pain, or with love, being in love, those are all distinct qualia, and the theory need, need to explain why. And now the, these theories are really different from what I call hypothesis. So the hypothesis Francis Crick and I made early on is that 40 hertz is important in, in consciousness. Well, that may be, but that's not a theory. That's a working That's a shrewd guess. That's a working hypothesis. Or, for example, when Matthew Larkham argues that um, you need these, um, this handshake, apical dendrites, and backpropagating action potential may be true, but that's not a fully fleshed out theory of consciousness. So um, this is a new on the stage, because before we only had philosophies that argued you know, about the ontology and about causality and does consciousness really exist or not. So these are specific theories. And of course, the hallmark of any field, once it emerges from, from, from metaphysics into physics and then into its allied sciences, is the emergence of, uh, of such theories. And so there's an interesting development. There's now a range of what's called adversarial collaboration. It's again a new phenomenon over the last five years. This is funded, these are funded by the Templeton World Charity Foundation. And uh, they're really experimenting in sociology of science. So the first one that was kicked off is between global neural workspace and integrated information theory, where you have a bunch of labs, in this case, 12 different labs, you have, you know, in this case, Julia Tononi and Stan Dehane, we, we all got together at a meeting in, in Seattle at my institute to hammer out a set of experiments that both sides could agree on, and this is really the trick, this is really the, the great challenge, that both sides could agree on, if we do these experiments and the, the outcome is this way, it'll tend to support IAT, and if the outcome is that way, it tends to support GNW. And of course, people are forever trying to game, you know, the, the system. Uh, so this is now done in humans using large-scale data, 500 subjects, using fMRI, EG, MEG, and ECOG with two experiments. A related experiment is done now in non-human primates uh, and in, in rodents, very similar experiment, uh, separate collaboration. And there are a few other collaborations between first-order and second-order theory. And again, so it involves different labs, at least two independent labs have to replicate all data. All data is made accessible to everyone. Um, there's common quality control, assurances, and finally all data will be public. 
So it's really a great experiment in the, in the sociology of, of, um, of science in general and particularly in consciousness. Now I wanted to end on, on two points. One is uh, psychedelics. So there are people much better informed about me, than me talking about it tomorrow. I wanted to s focus specifically on why they're relevant for studying consciousness, not on their possible therapeutic effects, which is why, of course, they're studied now. There's this golden, this renaissance, this, this, this gold rush almost, 60 companies are in this space. I'm primarily interested in them because they can teach us about, about consciousness. And so here I'm talking particularly about the serotonergic psychedelics that target a range of, of 2A, 2C, 1A receptors. So it's LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, DMT, and 5-MeO DMT. Uh, they have a low, low physiological toxicity, so it's very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to overdose. You don't get withdrawal synd uh, syndromes, and there's no compulsive uh, drug seeking. Um, in fact, they're relatively benign. Uh, the most likely risk is really you know, a bad trip and rarely uh, prolonged psychosis, which can happen. So, of course, there's a need to screen for subject with uh, personal or family history of uh, psychotic disorders, which, which is done today. So you need to go in with, with some care. We all know about the importance of, um, of, um, of set and, and setting. And, of course, today they're all uh, illegal since, since 1970. As you all know, this might change in the coming years with the successful conclu possible conclusion of, of um, of various clinical trials by USONA in particular, as well as by, by MAPS over the next several years if, if the outcome of those studies for treatment-resistant depression, for dep major depressive disorder, and for PTSD is positive, they would be uh, descheduled by the FDA, and you can get them off-label from your doctor. What I care about primarily, they would allow us to map out unusual states of consciousness. Uh, that don't occur every day, but they are conscious states, in a very systematic way. Um, because, so depending on which drug you take, these, these uh, call them alternate or different states of consciousness, they're just different. I'm not saying they access a higher reality. It's still, it's, it's, it's just a different state of consciousness, very different from everyday uh, consciousness. They can last anywhere, depending on the drug, between minutes, you know, 10 minutes and 10 hours. They have a variety of, of experiential um, effects. They could be perceptual, the shimmering, the motion trail, colors. They can be these amazing aesthetic experiences that you feel you're reborn, you feel like you're present at the birth of the universe, and you have this sense, this boundless sense of wonder, and you know, for the, you're just grateful for, the exi for existence. You, you, you sort of recover or you amplify the feeling of sacredness of, of all things. You, get, you can get complete loss of, of ego, yet still retain consciousness, so far for so much for higher order thought theories of consciousness. As I said, you can also get a certain uh, you know, um, uh, uh, states of fear, panic, confusion, impairment, which is why you want um, somebody there who's knowledgeable. Um, and, of course, you can also get psychodynamic acts, um, uh, aspects, you know, suppressed emotions and, and memories can also occur. You can also get, as in this near-death experience I showed you, uh, as shown by the, the Hieronymus Bosch picture, you can get these mystical experiences, including, you know, experience of unity, oceanic boundlessness, loss of perception of space and of time, which again is very different from the normal world. You always have a feeling of this is too slow, or this is too fast, or this is just right. But under some of these drugs, that, that, uh, that perceptual experience is totally gone. You can completely dissociate from the world, like under ketamine, uh, and the body. And of course, you can encounter spirits, messengers, and God uh, himself or herself. So it's quite similar, in fact, to near-death experiences or religious conversion experience of the sort that William James talks about in his variety of, uh, of religious experiences. And so I think these are the way I think about them as powerful consciousness modification techniques that can help us to more systematically explore the neural correlate of consciousness while people have them. Um, in a magnet, in a scanner, and using uh, EG, you know, you can think about patient with implanted electrodes, and of course in, 
in, um, in rodents and other experimental animals. And people, by and large, report these experiences as being some of their most meaningful of their life. So this is different from your typical undergrad experiment, where you have to stare for two hours at you know, faces or at little axes and bars. These are actually deeply enjoyable, and there's typically never a problem with finding volunteers. <laughs> and they probably are good for you. All right, so we are on the road to the physical substrate of consciousness, but we still have a long way to go. The brain is by far the most complex piece of highly organized matter in the universe. Our tools are powerful, but they've only begun to scratch it, and we should be under no illusion. Now, a younger version of me, 20 some years ago, um, you know, when I was more rah rah, and you know, we're going to do it in the next 10 years, I, I had this bet with David Chalmers that's due, I believe, uh, next year, and he's probably going to win. Uh, we, uh, I bet, oh, yeah, sure, come on, in 20 years, of course, we'll, we'll figure it out. Well, <laughs> all right, then I wanted to end here at, at this meeting. I wanted to talk about a, a funding opportunity that uh, some of you may be interested in. So as I said, I'm not only the chief scientist at the, at the, of the MindScope program at the Allen Institute, for, um, Allen Institute in Seattle, where we do brain science research, but I'm also um, uh, the chief scientist of the Tiny Blue Dot Foundation, which is a foundation based in Santa Monica and funded by Elizabeth Koch. And we funded over the last seven years quite a bit of research having to do with uh, disorders of consciousness. Some of this research with uh, uh, perturbational complexity index, among other, was, um, um, was uh, funded here under its uh, previous president, Sasha Bistrinsky, who is here in the, in the audience. Um, we, we're now um, pivoting and we are funding we're funding research that's still consciousness related, but on a slightly different angle. So it's, it, it's this under the theme of what's called, um, what Elizabeth calls uh, the perception box. So it's really the, the perception box, the way to think about it, it's really the sum total of the way you experience the world. We all live in our own perception box that, that's dictated by our genes and by our upbringing in a particular physical environment, in a particular social and cultural environment. You know, so it's a combination of, of nature versus, um, versus nurture. And this includes sort of spoken and unspoken assumptions about in-group, out-group selection, good behavior, bad behavior, uh, as well as your own adverse events in your childhood or trauma that you may have undergone. So our entire conscious, the way we experience the world, the way we, our consciousness is shaped within this perception box that has particular uh, boundaries. This is the most vivid perceptual demonstration of this I could find. So this is known as the dress. How many of you have seen this? Okay, so it's obviously white and yellow, right? So who sees it as white and yellow? And who sees it as, what's the other one, blue and black? You guys are so wrong. <laughs> okay, that's... <laughs> So it's, it's very striking. So it's actually, it's pretty rare actually for such a phenomenon. That's why it became so prominent. Because most of the time, you know, if I say what's that color, most of us will agree. But here for interesting reasons, we don't. The, the point I'm using it is here. So we, we believe that of course it's white and, and yellow. Of course it's blue and black. How could it be otherwise? So it's very important for us to realize, well, other people, may simply see it in another way, and that's sort of, that's their perception box. Now if you t translate that from perception to the way you think about, the way you approach things, the, the way you approach things emotionally, the way you, you vote, the, the, the way you engage with the world, you know, you can see that it generalizes that you live within a particular boundaries, and it's very difficult for you. You can sort of maybe rationally appreciate the other point of view, but when, it, when, when push comes to shove, you say, no, the world is like this, and we have to do that. And so the, it would be great if we, in, if we developed sort of uh, uh, consciousness modification techniques to change that, that people realize they live in a perception box. That's the very first step, right? To realize that the way you see the universe may not be the same someone else sees the universe. And it's, it's one, it's an equally legitimate point of view. Um, and so this, you know, this, this, this gives rise to a lot of suffering and low self-esteem polarization, distorted thinking, and other trauma that we experience in our society to today. 
So of course, this idea of perception box is a very complicated thing. It includes a lot of conscious and unconscious processes that psychologists and neuroscientists have studied over, over the last several hundred years. What we want to support is sort of in a very sustained and, and focused manner is to characterize the perception box, this set of conscious and unconscious beliefs and biases, and its boundaries in the brain. This is brain science research to track these boundaries and, and modify them with distinct intervention. And the intervention could be psychedelics, it could be mindfulness training, it could be breath work, it could be you know, uh, long-term meditation, it could be dancing, it could be you know, uh, uh, sweat lodges. I mean, if you look at particular outside our uh, Western culture, other cultures, the untold techniques that people have developed over, over the last thousands of years in diverse societies to modify, um, um, uh, to modify uh, brains and particularly to affect minds. We know changing behavior long term is really difficult. But we now begin, we, we, have, we are beginning to have tools where we can do that. And so we're interested in specifically funding those. Of course, we want to do it so to demonstrate the efficiency of this intervention to permanently and radically uh, and this might take several applications of whatever intervention it is, transform mental life by people, by helping people understand they live in a perception box, they, they have agency to expand their own walls. And so this requires this transformative conscious, uh, consciousness modification. And so what we're now getting ready to do, we'll announce this sometimes in the summer, a generalized request for proposals to carry out rigorous, statist empirically, statistically valid and sound scientific research to explore the neuronal and mental processes that underlie the perception box, how to expand consciousness using a variety of therapeutic in interventions, um, and how to measure and track the effectiveness of these interventions in the brain, because we believe ultimately we have to look towards the brain. So this is uh, worldwide, it's not just in the US. This first round, it's, it's going to be a series over the next years. The first round is based for you know, MD, PhDs at universities, medical schools, not-for-profit research institutions anywhere on the planet. It'll be sort of uh, for three years funding for on the order of 900K, $900,000. And what we're going to do, because we've done quite well at it at the Allen Institute, is to do a, non, is to do a double blind review process where you submit your proposal and the research part of the proposal itself actually has to be written in a way that it's, you can't, the, uh, the identity can't be inferred, it then goes out to, rever to reviewers, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's double blind and then we'll, we'll, we'll select the, the, top, the top processes. So just watch at this, we're just revamping the, the website, watch that uh, go out in, you know, sometimes in summer. And with that, I, uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christoph. That was uh, excellent, great, fantastic. Uh, if you have questions, please line up here. We have some time. Uh, I'm not going to respond to the uh, suggestion that the brain is too warm, wet, and noisy for quantum effects, <laughs> except to say that uh, uh, we think anesthesia, which selectively uh, acts on consciousness, shows us where in the brain the quantum effects are in the nonpolar hydrophobic regions, hydrophobic meaning not wet, uh, <coughs> warm, yes, but uh, in structures like microtubules, the heat can pump quantum coherence and therefore not noisy. So we call that the quantum underground and microtubules can be mesoscopic in length. So there is the opportunity for quantum effects uh, in mesoscopic and macroscopic uh, scale in the brain. So maybe in two years or so we'll have a big debate about that. Or Maybe before. Okay, uh, please uh, be brief and one question per person, please. Hello, uh, my name is Mike. Uh, I have some background in math and physics and interest in knowledge man uh, I can't think of the terminology, I'm a little nervous. Um, uh, basically, the, on the topic of the perception box, uh, following from that, um, I don't know if you are familiar with Nicholas Luhmann and his uh, slip box or the set of costumes. With what? Uh, Nicholas uh, Luhmann's Zettelkasten, or the slip box method of basically organizing knowledge, the things you give your attention to, and etc. Well, I've been personally doing that over 
uh, I don't know, eight months or so. And I've been looking towards incorporating experiments into this and possibly forming some database of brain activity. Um, I was wondering about minimum specifications that, or uh, types of EEGs that I could possibly buy for myself to measure my brain activity as I organize my uh, personal things that I give attention to in my own version of a perception box. Um, in terms of uh, equipment acquisition, I guess, would be that question. Yeah, I mean, that's, if you can make it part of the grant, but it's too early to talk about those details. Yeah, but if it's part of the grant, uh, that's what you need, then we'll fund it if the grant gets funded, yes. Oh, this is personal. This is sort of just, I'm just wondering what is like a, I'm looking for like a minimum, possibly a recommended minimum specification of site, like, uh, the the specif the precision needed I, in the I activity mean, I measurement. I suggest we talk afterwards about the details. Okay, about thank what you. What instrument you need? All right. You want a shielded room, probably. And thank you for the talk. <laughs> Hi. Great talk. Thank you very much. I have a question about um, where consciousness is generated in the brain. So you um, described a lot of um, of um, um, Test and examples that it's in the posterior part. Uh, did you check about um, what about uh, conscious states of about uh, thinking and thoughts? Maybe this is more in the anterior part or in the prefrontal, and it's just harder to you know to check those kind of qualia. It's possible. So I agree with you. The vast majority of studies today involve vision, auditions, uh, touch because they're easiest to study. Uh, we don't know from these patients, so the Brickner patient, they talk, they still have thoughts in their head, so it's not that, that their inner voice is totally gone. But it's well possible, look, a priori, I've not, I, I, I just go where the empirical evidence is, and right now the evidence seems to be uh, it's more in the back than in the front. Does it mean that no area of prefrontal cortex uh, contributes? No, it does not. Yeah. I mean, one has to be pragmatic. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for the talk, Christoph. So I'm curious if you could just kind of give a framework around this, the question that I'm going to ask. So we spent a lot of time talking about consciousness in the brain, and I'm curious about a very different perspective. In a pregnant woman, what is consciousness in the womb, where a female has her brain up here, but she has a completely developing brain inside her womb there. And so kind of two, two aspects of that, one is there, you know, microtubules in the pelvic uh, region and the, 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 the generative organs? Is there microtubules in the umbilical cord? You know, the sense of consciousness that arises in the lower part of the body. So that's kind of one aspect of it. But the second is a, a, a female perspective on the dialogue. Because what? The, a feminine, a feminine, a woman perspective on the dialogue of consciousness. You know, yesterday in many of the, the sessions, there were many pictures of famous scientists, you know, thrown up on the screen, and they were men. Okay? So is there a gender orientation to the dialogue that we're having at the conference? I don't know. I, I can tell you something about the first, uh, um, and the first question. So as far as we know, fetal development uh, in cortex, which we believe is a structure that's relevant, doesn't occur till the third trimester. So it's probably only in the third trimester that the fetus would itself may have some inkling of conscious experience. However, the brain at that early stage is sedated by, by, by substances in the umbilical cord and um, it's a somewhat low oxygen environment and all the, the reversal potentials are quite different from from after birth, so it's unclear whether there's any conscious sensation. There's certainly two different types of activity pattern. There's the brain, uh, the baby when it's more active, and the, the mother will feel that because the baby is kicking. So there's certainly an active sleep and a more less active sleep that appear to be precursor of REM and non-REM sleep. If that were true, then again, it would suggest that the baby is always deeply asleep, the, the third trimester baby is deeply asleep. Of course, the, um, that's different if, if, it's a, if, it's a pre uh, if it's a premature uh, born baby. But in utero, the evidence seemed to suggest that the first, your first conscious moment was when you were ejected from your mom's womb 
and you had to make your way into the world, which is loud and noisy and cold, and you have this massive surge in, in stress hormones and, and adrenaline, etc., during the moment of birth, as you get squeezed through the birth canal, and then you cry, and that may be the first time that you have some conscious experience of the world. Mm. Thank you. Do you know when pyramidal cells develop in the fetus? Yeah, they, so, so they develop already in the second trimester, but they don't link up with the external input arising from the thalamus till like week 22, 23, 24. So some of the, the early, the pyramidal cells are there already in the second trimester. Hi, thanks so much for the talk. Um, I was hoping to ask your thoughts on the problem of potential consciousness in human cerebral organoids with regards to NCCs and where you think that might be going. Yeah, it's a very interesting question, cerebral organoids. So I've written about this before. For me, I believe that if, if I have a piece of cortical tissue, like a pizza that's this big, that has a lot of the elements of cortex with pyramidal cells, including with afferent activity, that that piece of cortex may feel like something. And so then the question is, does it have to be as big as us, you know, 1,200 square centimeter? Or what about if it's only a centimeter? So, so far, the, if you look at the existing cerebral organoids, their electrical complexity is still very uh, low, they, but they're beginning to show simple patterns of birth suppression, like you would get in a very early preterm uh, infant. So, at some, I don't think we're there yet, but at some point, if the uh, tissue technology, particularly once we go to three-dimensional tissue and we can co-culture them with vascular, you know, with vascular, we will get to the stage where it may well feel like something although how much it feels like something to be just a thing in, the, in a dish which doesn't have inputs and it doesn't have motor output, so what does it feel like is not quite clear. But I think sooner or later we will get there, and so we, people are beginning to think about the ethical implications of that, and how would I know? Based, the best way is you look at the brain activity and does it have any complexity similar to the complexity that we have in an awake uh, spontaneous EEG, then we're there. Phase coupling, all right? Yeah. Do you think that's important, phase coupling between EEG levels? Uh, possibly, and it may, we may be. I don't think it's been seen yet in these, uh, in these uh, cerebral organoids, because it's not really an EEG yet, because typically they, they still only grow very small, right? They're like lentil, they're like two to three millimeters across. I, th I think Allison found phase coupling. But Hi, thank you. I, I, uh, I find it fascinating how such a rich career of research has emerged from such an elegant initial premise that you had uh, with Crick around the um, neural correlates of consciousness. And, and so just thinking in, in simplistic terms, it seems like there's this infinite palette of perceptual uh, variation you know, that you can imagine that a person can perceive around them. How does that map onto the neural correlates of consciousness? Are there an infinite, is that an infinite space as well? You know, neural patterning uh, to be able to map the... It's not infinite in the mathematical sense because it's a finite piece of matter so there are only a finite number of combinations. But look, given in cortex alone we have 16 billion cortical cells. In cortex alone, there are probably several hundred different cell types, okay? So you have, so if you just look at the combinatorics, you know, take 16 billion, each one, so 200 to the 16 billion, that's, that's you know, vastly more than, than uh, atoms in the universe. So yes, the complexity of each brain, even if you take two brains of it, uh, twins, identical twins that are not actually that identical, there's just dizzying variety, so that's why, uh, that's why sort of each conscious experience is so utterly um, unique, yet they're common enough elements that we can have a conversation and we all agree, well, you know, we all can see this cool brain in this, you know, Oumua Oumua like, uh, like, you know, picture here. We all see that, but the, all the details will be different in your brain and my brain. And if I look at it in five minutes from now, again, it'll differ slightly because my brain is slightly different. Mm -hmm. You put Nagel's quote up, um, what about in simpler organisms? That, is that to suggest that they um, have a, a, a somehow restricted uh, or bounded 
uh, perceptual space well, it's less because bound, they have... Yeah, it, 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 so consciousness will grow. The, the representational capacity of consciousness increases with a brain size. So a smaller creature, like a dog, I love dogs, they're highly conscious, but you know, they don't think about the weekend, they don't worry about general relativity in the war in Ukraine, and a mouse does it even less, and a fly or a bee will even do it less. But the bee feels like something, and probably, it ha well, we know when it's in a positive state, it has some hormones that are very similar to oxytocin that we have. And the, the, the bee may only have, you know, several hundred thousand neurons, but it's incredible. In fact, its circuit density is 10 times higher than our circuit density. So presumably it feels like something to be a bee, but the bee doesn't have the voice in the head that I have, and that you have. So it grades. And the interesting question is, where does it end? You know, are there some creatures that we can say for certain that they're more like the cerebellum, that they don't feel like anything, or does it go all the way down? That's an empirical, very difficult to address question right now. Thank you, great talk. Um, I did want to challenge and kind of ask you to elaborate on your logic behind thinking that the brain is the sole location for consciousness in the body. So you did use some justification that's interesting about paraplegic patients still being able to have a relatively normal conscious experience, but their experience of things like emotions is actually highly altered. And so how is it that you can kind of separate out, well, respiration, digestion, heart rate, that's not actually involved. Um, my other comment about that was, it is interesting the, the involvement of the posterior cortex or the posterior medial cortex a bit more and like actually maintaining the awareness, the conscious awareness um, as we can kind of interact with a human. But it's almost like, to me, I, I'm not really sure that's where the consciousness is, but rather the solidification of the consciousness into what it means to have a human self. So there is research with virtual lesions or um, on uh, seizure patients and exploratory surgical patients where they've been removing tumors that they can stimulate around in the posterior medial cortex. And consciousness can kind of remain, but it becomes almost non-human, like somebody's dissociated, floating above their body, you know, seeing different stimulus. Yep. They're not unconscious. No, they're highly conscious. So, yeah, yeah, what are your comments on the body involvement of consciousness and okay, the Okay, so your of, quite, the second yeah. question is very easy, yes. Yeah. So from, for example, Pavisi has this patient last year in PNES where you stimulate in area, um, you know, uh, uh, Post, um, underneath the cuneus, precuneus, mm -hmm. and you, uh, either the patient has a seizure there, and he sort of ha these mini seizures he experiences himself. He gets his depersonalization, mm -hmm. uh, not derealization, but depersonalization. You can stimulate; you have the same effect. Yeah, and we also we knew from uh, Carter Harris and other experiments on psilocybin on deep meditation. You get typically reduction in that part of the brain, and your sense of self, mm -hmm. your conscious experience of self, seems to be reduced. So I think that shows us that at least that's one of the nodes for the NCC for self, and you can lose yourself without be without losing consciousness. There's mm -hmm. no question about it. I mean, the, the first experience I put up on my slide, there was no sense of self. There was no Christoph there. Yet, yet what whatever non-dual thing you know, remain was highly conscious. So you can get consciousness without knowing that I'm a man, I'm gonna die, I'm Christoph, all of that. With respect to your first question, I totally agree. We now know that the entire body is wired. Uh, you know, the peripheral nervous system extends into our gut, into our anterior viscera, into our sexual organs, into our skin, and all of that information is brought together, however, in cortex. So the, the claim is that if you lose, if you have the unfortunate um, if you're going to lose your cortex, you will not have conscious sensation anymore. Although there might still be things that go up from your gut. In fact, you, you can see it in these uh, persistent vegetative state patients. Jody McMath, for instance, they, they, they still have a metabolism, they still have digestion, but there's no evidence whatsoever that there's any consciousness left. But it, it informs us all the time, totally. The entire body is wired. So there is a relationship between ability to recover from a coma and heart rate variability. And what? Heart rate variability. Do you, uh, do you think that's coming from brain regulation of it? No, well, that involves the, you know, the vagus nerve. And, mm -hmm. and we know the vagus nerve, you know, it's, it goes up and it goes, you know, it's ascending and descending that provides information um, and to the brain. There's no question about it. Okay, thank you. Two more questions, please be brief. 
Hi there. I just wanted to ask about what you thought about consciousness, because consciousness usually think of like a person is conscious, and there's only like one conscious inside of a person, right? And so I just wanted to ask in this, you know, thought experiment, you know, if I took two people and I could hook them up together, would then there only be one consciousness between the two bodies? What would happen? And then as just a sort of short extension of it, have you ever studied two-headed animals? Yes. Okay, so the first one, I, I've written extensively about it. I call it brain bridging. So if I connect my brain and your brain, you can essentially do the inverse of a reverse split brain experiment. So just remember what happened in split brain experiments. You take, an inter you take one single consciousness and one brain. For surgical reason, you cut the complete corpus callosum, anterior, posterior, commissure included. And as far as we can tell, you get two conscious entities inside one skull. One can speak, the left but you get the other one that's also conscious, can sing, can answer simple yes, no question, etc. So now we do the inverse. We take two normal brains, you and mine, we connect it. At some point, what will happen, there will be one conscious entity, which is going to be some combination of you and I, but at a loss of the individual conscious entity. So there won't be my consciousness and this uber consciousness and your consciousness, and there will only just be one consciousness that now has two brains that talks through two mouths that has you know, four arms and four legs. Yes, I call this brain bridging. In fact, I've written a science fiction story based on it. So there can be a hive mind. Well, yeah, but only, remember the hive mind, you know, the Borg, remember that Captain Kirk lost his own consciousness. That's a point. Because <laughs> at any point in time, there's only one conscious thing. Yes, so if you get absorbed by the hive, by the Borg, then the, 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 the consciousness of the Borg may expand a little bit, but it comes at a loss of consciousness of the individual. It has to be like that, conceptually at least. Thank you. Last question. Hi, I was just thinking that uh, a lot of therapists who would be very good at ripping down the perception box and therapying it don't have brain science labs. I was wondering whether the blue dot's going to set up any mechanism whereby high-functioning therapists can discover brain science labs and make an application for this funding. I don't know. I would love to know that. <laughs> You're entirely right. Okay, let's give Christoph a big hand.